of the animal count. Okay, so um, got it. So this this tree is a very is an oversimplification of animals, and you can see. Uh, can you see my pointer actually or not? Moving on the screen. Yes. Okay. So we can summarize all these groups of animals as most of the animals that we know. Uh, Protostomes, deuterostomes, and that includes ass and mollusks and arthropods. These are all the bilaterian animals, and and that's not something I'm going to focus about today. And then we have a bunch of other groups of animals, cnidarians. You're familiar with, you know, sea anemones and and uh, corals and uh, jellyfish. Then we'll talk about sponges. We'll talk about tinophores. The word teens is what defines the name tinophores, and uh, about these other group of very small flat animals called placozoans, right? This is this is really what I'm trying to figure out. And you'll see that a lot of the debate is actually about where is the root of the animal tree. In fact, we pretty much agree on the general skeleton, you know, with all the genomic and phylogenetic techniques that we've done today. But there is still a big debate whether the root is placed between sponges and the rest of the animals or whether the root is placed between tinophores and the rest of the animals. And it's a very trivial thing, you know, from graph theory, right? Is, well, is it here, is it here? It's not that different, but it has huge implications about how we understand animal evolution. Because if the root is placed between sponges and the rest, we follow this old idea of an increase in complexity. Sponges have very few, very few cell types and they lack a nervous system. While, for example, tinophores have a complex body with more cell types and they have nerve cells and they have muscle cells. So if the root is placed here, this means that, you know, the common ancestor to all animals might have had much more complexity than we have believed for hundreds of years of studying animal evolution. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of, you know, mini lecture on two aspects of sponges and tinophores. And for sponges, I'm going to focus, you know, this is a beautiful picture of one uh, encrusting sponge. Uh, sponges come, if you want, in two types, you know, the ones that leave, uh, you know, flat encrusting the sediment, and they're competing with many other animals that live on those sediments. They're trying to grow in, in just uh, two dimensions, or you have erect sponges that grow in three dimensions, like this giant barrel sponge from a tropical environment, right? Most sponges are more of this kind, encrusting, they grow on rocks, or they grow on shells of other animals, uh, but those are the sponges, right? Um, I wanna show you a little video about how sponges feed. So the, the most important thing of the biology of sponges that, that has fascinated biologists for a long time is that they have a special type of cells that I will explain in a second called coanocytes. And those cells, what they do, these sponges, and for a long time, people didn't even think that sponges were animals. But what you're going to see here is how those cells are moving the water in the environment, actively moving the water from the environment, passing it through the sponge to get the food particles that are in the water in suspension, and then they exhale this water, right? And this is an active pumping mechanism that they use for uh, feeding. So I'm going to stop sharing this uh, slide. I'm going to share um, a video that I want you to see. And this is a video from a beautiful series. I've been using this for more than 20 years. I used to have the DVDs. Then it was impossible to play DVDs and computers. And they finally uh, released all these segments of the stories in, in this website, which is a beautiful zoology class. Um, here we go. Um, and let me know, you can hear the sound, right? Yeah, the sound is okay. No, what? There's no sound yet. What? For two and a half billion years, yes. single-celled organisms dominated the Earth. 
They were minuscule creatures, completely enclosed in a fragile. Sorry, I, don't, I don't want to show the whole video. These were little uh, beings, but they were not animals. Minute 156. Somehow, cells developed a language that allowed them to work together. When they did, it was a turning point for life on Earth. There you go. It's solid. But a closer look reveals a labyrinth of tiny holes, tunnels, and chambers. Unlike our bodies, sponges have no definitive shape. They are as varied as their many habitats. I'm, I'm scientists showing. have described more than nine i'm showing the wrong video uh can you see this one now the, yeah okay this is what i wanted to show you it's just a segment of that of that little video so what they do here they inject dye in the water to see how the water flows through the sponge okay To make the invisible visible, Diaz injects a harmless colored dye into the water near the body of a sponge. One of the ways we can test for the rate of water flow that moves through the sponge body is to inject a colored dye and measure the speed at which it is pumped through the sponge. When I start seeing the colored dye, coming out of the sponge in less than two seconds from when it was applied. I could not believe my eyes. This steady and strong continuous flow of water continuously coming out of the sponge was an incredible realization of the dynamic existence of this organism. The, the walls of the sponges are really thick, so diffusion would not allow all this dye to go through. And you'll see now it starts coming really it's an fast. Incredible sight to witness. These ghostly exhalations are proof that the sponge is actively pumping. With no mouth, it sucks water directly through its sponge-like body walls, which are shot through with millions of narrow canals and tiny chambers. All right, you get the point. Uh, the active pumping, this is much faster than the diffusion rate of, of that dye that they're including in the sponge. So that's what shows us that the sponges are living animals, and the importance of one specific type of cell that is called the coanocyte. It's the cell is what we call a collard cell. It has a collar of microvilli, and then it has a longer cilium or flagellum in the middle that it uses for moving, for creating the water currents. And they are lined, this is a very simple schematic of a sponge. Uh, they're lined in the interior part of this atrium. Right, so they have other types of cells outside. We don't talk about an epithelium here, but it has different types of cells. And then the internal chambers of the sponge are entirely covered by these coanocytes. Right? Why am I talking about coanocytes? Coanocytes are complex uh, cells. You can see here the color of microvilli. You can hear the long flagellum, and it's the beating of that flagellum that moves the water current. And then the microvilli might have a function in feeding by trapping the, the uh, particles of food that are going through the water, right? And all the cells in the sponge can trap uh, food particles. They have different mechanisms for ingesting the, those. Um, and one of them for the really small particles is called pinocytosis, right? Now, these cells 
have played a very important historical role in our understanding of animal phylogeny because there is a group of single cell organisms. They are not animals. There are some of these uh, protozoans called coanoflagellates. And I will talk a little bit more about them. They can leave a single cells. They can also aggregate and, and integrate certain behaviors in a way. And they are, coanoflagellates now are known to be the sister group of animals. There's no doubt from this whole clade of holozoans, the coanoflagellates are the sister group to metazoan, right? Because the cells of coanoflagellates are very similar to the coanocytes of sponges. And because sponges are simple animals with very few cell types, with a lack of a nervous system, we had believed for a long time that there was these basically coanoflagellates, a sister group to animals, and then the simplest animals with fewer types of cells, peripherans or sponges and placozoans were at the base of the animal tree. And these, you know, fit very well all our beliefs about the evolution of the cell types and evolution of colonial organisms to multicellular organisms, right? So you go from single cell to coloniality. And then when there is integration of cells, you start forming, you know, graded, um, types of integration until you have tissue level organization. But because sponges and placozoans in principle don't have tissue level organization, they only have a few cell types because the major or the most characteristic cell type of sponges is very similar anatomically to the coanocytes, sorry, to uh, coanoflagellates. This has been the prevalent idea about animal evolution for a long, long time, okay? That's one of the things that we're going to discuss, the role of the uh, coanocytes. Now let's go see a very different type of animal, a beautiful, much larger, well, some sponges are very, much larger than any teen, of course, but in general, they're animals that you recognize body parts. This is Nemiopsis lady, for very voracious carnivores. If you look at this photo, has one tentacle here trapping a shrimp. And in fact, the stomach is full of shrimp. You know, this is like a, a shrimp bar here for them, right? They're, they eat large prey. They have these tentacles. They can be, they can have different shapes. This one is a, a one species that are very flat, that they live in the benthos. Others, you know, they swim constantly with this iridescent thing that you see here that we're going to talk about. And, and those are the teens of the team, right? Let's look a little bit at a at, at Tinofor live moving. Um, this is a movie of basically one of those Tinofors moving. You can see actually, this is food, food particles, you know, being moved inside the digestive cavity. And then you see this beautiful color, uh, which is actually not uh, color, it's just a, an optical effect of the movement of the cilia, the way they are packed and how they reflect light of these structures that we call teens or complates. Okay. If you look at schematic here, it is a schematic, it's not a real animal, but the schematic of this tinophore with the tentacles, it has these eight rows or, or four pairs of rows of um, complates that we call the teens. That's what gives the name to the, the group tinophores, right? And, and those structures is just to show you that these are animals that are more complex. They have, you know, integration of the movement of these things. They use them for controlling uh, movement. I actually love, um, the, you know, how this, this organ is controlled just by the very simple, you know, from an engineering point of view, one of the most simple organs in the, uh, sense organs in the animal kingdom. Basically, these are different views of the, uh, up oral or the apical view of uh, a tinophore. These are the four pairs of the comb plates, and they all basically are, you know, suspended in one chamber with one structure that we call the statolith. Those are mineral precipitation that form a little ball. And when you look at that from a, from a, you know, kind of side view, you can see that the statolith is suspended by four, you know, uh, structures. 
that are basically, as the animal moves in one direction, is putting more pressure, let's say, in these uh, complete, and then these ones will swim to go back to the general direction, right? So it's a very simple thing that the way of this statolith is telling the tinophore how it is oriented based on gravity in the water. And they can control the movement of the teens, you know, the beating far, faster, you know, or, or harder in order to maintain their position. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of these teens. The teens are the complex. They're actually compound cilia, cilia that are all attached to each other, very long cilia. And the movement of that cilia is what controls the animal, right? So we've seen sponges with very few cell types, uh, without a nervous system, without muscles. And here we have an animal that has an integrated level to provide information. It has a nervous system. It has muscles. So again, if we go back to some of that phylogeny, people like Klaus Nielsen, for example, place tinophores really high up in the tree, even among bilaterians, right? Most authors didn't think so. Most authors would place it near to Nidarians. And in fact, for a long time, Nidarians and Tinophores were classified in the same group. Now we know they're not really together, but basically you can see that Tinophores are a much more complex type of animals. A few years ago, now it's more like, like 14 years ago, we did one of the first studies uh, looking in, you know, we've been doing molecular phylogenetics now for quite a long time. For the first 10, 20 years of molecular phylogenetics, we used just a few genes, and it was very hard to reconstruct the phylogeny of the earliest diversification of animals because this is something that happened more than half a billion years ago. So with the new sequencing techniques, this is actually prior to Illumina sequencing or anything like that, but we started generating larger numbers of sequences. And in 2008, we published a phylogeny that, that got quite a lot of attraction. We got the cover of nature. This is a project that I was leading from the National Science Foundation. And while we wanted to focus on the relationships of the protostome animals, that is the grant that we had, we sample across animal phyla for the first time for these ESTs. And we found that in our tree, tinophores here in green and not sponges were the sister group to all other animals. And this was heresy to say the least. Uh, we got a lot of pushback for a long time. And, and, but this is the result that our data support, right? Since we published this paper in 2008, pretty much every year there's been papers pro and against the position of Tinofor. So basically we'll talk about some of this debate as one hypothesis, the one we propose where Tinofors are sister group to all other animals. And the other one, we can call it sort of the traditional hypothesis where sponges are sister group to all other animals, okay? This is the big question about animal evolution. There might be a few differences in the relationships of the other groups. Everyone, you know, here, for example, this phylogeny, which is not supported by any studies really now, uh, had placozoans early in the animal evolution and tinophores and nadarians still going together. This is not what we find today. But back then, this was a response to our paper in Nature, and they presented these, these alternative phylogeny. And again, they've been going back and forth. I'm not going to, you know, there's both uh, sets of arguments. I'll show you some results that might be a bit more conflictive. It could be either one. What I want is to deconstruct a little bit what's been happening here and understand that perhaps evolution doesn't go from simple to complex. Okay. So the question here is are, or one of the questions we could ask is that if sponges are the sister group to all other animals, because they retain this plesiomorphic type of cell that is a quadrocyte that is very similar to quanoflagellates, the question is, are these two cells homologous, right? That's, that's a logical question in evolution. 
And, and people have looked at that. And there are, you know, different informations. For example, about a decade ago, the group of uh, Pavel Parkhart did a really beautiful anatomical study of both coanoflagellates when they are individual uh, cells, coanoflagellates when they aggregate which is like the intermediate step to multicellularity, if you want, and then um, guanoflagellates when they are aggregated, right? And they studied these things, you know, with serial TEM section where they could reconstruct, you know, the structure of the microvilli, the structure of the uh, organelles that are inside. And, you know, one of the conclusions of the paper is that, look, the, the two cells look very similar, but they also have some key differences, right? Now, this is not telling us either or, because you would not expect the two cells from organisms that have diverged six, seven, eight hundred million, a billion, million years ago will be identical, right? So are the differences the result of evolution or are the differences the result of convergence towards some type of cell that is very useful, right? And we're not going to resolve that. It's, that's a very difficult question. But I want to show you a figure that they use in that paper, because until now, the assumption is that sponges are the sister group to all other animals because they have coanocytes. And the coanocytes are similar to the coanoflagellates. But actually, they showed a trick where not only sponges have cells that look like coanoflagellates. And we know that in, in the textbook that Jane showed you, actually, I go chapter by chapter saying, you know, starfish have cells that are also quanocyte like that. They have the microvilli and then they have the flagellum. And you find those also in acils and you find those in some cnidarians and you find some similar cells in placosomites. So it turns out that yes, quanocytes are one of the major cell types in sponges. And they're not one of the major cell types in any of the other animals. But they are cells that look like that for some specific organs, sometimes for sensory organs, sometimes for other organs in other animals. So what I want to say here is the simple presence or absence of coanocyte type cells is not enough to say that sponges are at the base. And the reason that they might have many is because they are filter feeders, because they need cells with a flagellum moving large amounts of water, otherwise they couldn't feed, right? So that's one part of the argument about whether those two cells are homologous. They could be homologous, but then there will be homologous cells in many other metazoans. Therefore, that cannot be the sole uh, reason to place uh, these animals at the base of the animal tree. There's been a lot of other research going on since these debates started. And one of them has focused on the genomics of sponges and tenophores. You know, to be honest, uh, 12 years ago when we did, no one was working on, very few people were working on sponges and tenophores and no one really cared about a lot of these aspects. So these really trigger a lot of research in, on the anatomy, on the genomics. And one of the things that people started seeing when they did genomics, of tenophores or sponges or things like that is that, remember one of the arguments is that tenophores are closer related to other animals because they both share a nervous system while sponges and placozoans lack a nervous system. But it turns out when they start looking at the genomic architecture of these animals, the neurotransmitters that you find in most animals with a nervous system are actually also found in sponges and placosomans that don't have a nervous system. But tenophores that have a nervous system, they have completely different neurotransmitters. So people started asking questions like, okay, yes, they have a nervous system, but has the nervous system in animals evolved independently? Once in tenophores and another time in the rest of the animals, right? And there's conflicted information from the neurotransmitter, from the genomics component, which tells us that they're very different. And if you want a little bit from the anatomical component, say, well, but they do have cells that are interconnected that look like neurons, right? How do we resolve some of these? And, and that was, again, resolved by the same group 
that compare the coanocytes of uh, sponges with the coanoflagellates, a group of Pavel Burhardt. Uh, and I just saw a presentation from him this last summer about this paper that came out last year, which is a beautiful 3D anatomical reconstruction of the tenophore nervous system. So they've paid close attention to the two homologies here, to the coanocytes and to the nervous system of, um, of tenophores. And one of the thing, you know, this is the, one of the hypotheses that we're seeing, coanoflagellates are the sister group to metazoans. We have first animals with the coanocytes and without a nervous system, then the nervous system evolves once and has been lost in placozoans. So we already have to admit, no matter what is the hypothesis today, that the nervous system can be lost because it's been lost in placozoans and there's no doubt about it. And again, placozoans have the same neurotransmitters that we find in animals with a true nervous system, right? So when they start looking at the anatomy of the nervous system of, of tenophores, they find that they is really, really different from everything else. And I'm not a neuroanatomist, I'm sure many of you aren't, but they did the serial TEM reconstruction where they can reconstruct every neuron of the animal. And I only want you to pay attention to one panel, panel B. This is one neuron of a tenophore. You remember your cell biology classes, you know, normally you have a cell body and then one extension, normally might be unipolar or bipolar, you know, neurons. This is forming a network. The one cell body is interconnecting with itself in many different, so signals are transmitted in a very different way and they use different neurotransmitters that we find in another nervous system. And the question here is the same one that I asked you earlier. Are these two cells, quanocytes and quanoflagellates, different because they're converging or are they different because there's a long time of evolution behind them, right? Well, here we could ask the same question. Is this different, very different type of neuron an independent origin of a nervous system or is this very different because there's a long time of evolution between these two groups? So. You know, under this scenario here, there's a single origin of a nervous system that is very different in tenophores than in the rest of the animals, in Nigerians and bilaterians, with some losses. If you change the position of this animal, like they do with this dotted line to the base, it requires perhaps an independent origin of a nervous system in tenophores, and then a second origin of the nervous system here. And this is all a question of what's more possible, one gain with very different nervous systems and one loss, or just two independent gains. And we're not gonna resolve that, apply, you know, appealing to any logic or anything like that, right? So it's a matter of understanding that these structures can be very different, that we have, you know, similar cells that are present across metazoans that have similar functions, but we don't know whether they're homologous or not, we have different types of neurons in Nadirians and bilaterians from those that we have in tenophores and they use different neurotransmitters. And that's why, you know, this scenario of tenophores being earlier is becoming to be plausible. When I was in this meeting, this is the International Congress for Invertebrate Morphology last summer, a um, couple, let's say, older generation of zoologists, morphologists who have never believed any of our results about phylogeny placing tenophores more basally, both came to me and said, you know, I still think sponges are, you know, sister group to all other animals. But until yesterday, I thought that was 100%. Today, it's 70%, right? So for them conceding now, 30%, this is very traditional morphologists conceding the this is actually showing you that actually nervous systems might not be different. They don't believe our molecular phylogenies. They think there might be errors, they might, but they're beginning to believe some of these anatomical data that are telling us that these nervous cells and the different you know, genetic machinery to communicate between cells might be of different origins. 
there might be a possibility of a convergent origin of nervous system in animals. So that gives you a little bit more chance of placing these animals more basically in the tree. And therefore thinking maybe the early animals were already complex animals with multiple cells, with nervous systems, with muscles. And there's been reduction. We know for sure there's been a reduction in placozoa. Everyone accepts that based on all phylogenetic evidence. Why couldn't that happen also in sponges, right? And in fact, we know that's happening in other groups. There are groups nested within cnidarians that for a long time were considered protozoans. And now we know that they're reduced single cell animals that are derived within Nidaria. And so this argument that reduction of a nervous system is not possible, reduction of types of cells is not possible, we know that has happened multiple times. We know that there are worms, you know, within the phylum Annelida, orthonectids, that spend most of their life cycle as a plasmodium in the tissue of other animals, right? And only in one moment in their life cycle, they form these tiny worms with four nervous cells and 10 muscle cells for reproduction. And then they go back to this plasmodium type living, right? So this idea that all metazoans have muscles and they're complex, we know there's been multiple reductions higher up in the tree. Why couldn't we have a reduction more basally in the tree? So that's what I want to tell you in terms of like the history of this debate and, and part of the lecture. And then I'll tell you a little bit how we're addressing that from the phylogenetic point of view, right? We have been, you know, the goal of one of the goals of my lab has been to reconstruct these higher level phylogenetics, these specific problems about animal phylogeny. And, and just to, you know, many of you are very young and you don't, you know, to put things in perspective, the first animal phylogeny using DNA came out in 1988. This was at the end of uh, my graduate uh, undergrad when I was about to begin my PhD. And I really wanted to work in, um, sorry, no, it came out when, when I was an undergrad, right? But I already, very few zoologists did anything, anything related to molecular phylogenetics. This tree is pretty bad, by the way. It doesn't matter. It was a proof of concept paper, seminal paper in science showing that you can reconstruct phylogenies using DNA. I know that's for you, that's a given, but it wasn't at the time. It took only 10 years from the first molecular phylogeny until the first animal genome was assembled. And that was C. elegans in 1988, before Drosophila, before the human genome that was in 2001. But even, you know, the 2001 genome, human genome, that had a cost of about $100 million. The technology available at the time only allowed to sequence little fragment by little fragment. You know, once you had a fragment, you design a new primer, you continue walking a chromosome. The chromosomes were divided into sections. Each section was given to a lab, hundreds of labs around the world sequenced piecemeal, you know, that genome, that human genome. And since 2001, many times we've heard yeah, we finally completed the human genomes, right? This was like a first draft, actually two first drafts in 2001. The first contiguous human genome has been published in 2022. Until now, there were gaps in the human genome, right? There's been a paradigm shift in technology. This was Sanger sequencing. This was the appearance of short read sequencing at the time 454 and uh, Illumina. And then there's been a few other paradigm shifts here with long read sequencing, like things like Oxford Nanopore or Pacific Biosciences. And that's what we're doing today to have very large chunks of DNA so you don't have gaps in between. And then a lot of short reads to, to you know, fill in and have more accuracy in some of those long reads, right? You could sequence a human genome today for about a thousand dollars, will be much better then the genome that they sequenced in 2001 for hundred million dollars with hundreds of labs involved, right? So the technology has changed a lot. And with the technology, the, the instruments have changed a lot. This is what they did for the first human genome. They could sequence fragments of about 900 base pairs, but very few fragments at a time. 
short read sequencing when for very short sequences of 300 base pairs up to 300 base pairs, but you could generate, you know, thousands of gigabases in, in, in just one day, right? Uh, and a lot of the new technologies are going towards very long reads uh, and, you know, a decent amount of data and combining this technology with this technology, this is what you can do now, very high accurate genomes. Some of these technologies portable, this is just a mini ion, uh, mini ion, you can hold it in your hand. This is actually a genome of a snail that we did in the lab or some of my students in the lab did. Uh, and they did it in the field. They took this mini ion and portable lab to the Maldives and they sequenced this genome in the field, reaching, you know, some of the fragments, a hundred kilobases with this short read technology, right? And, and a very nice distribution of, of read length. So this is not a very complete genome because it's just one run of Oxford nanopore. This was also done four or five years ago, but today you can do this in a more routine way. Anyway, so we've been incorporating a lot of these advances into the study of, of genomes, and, and we've gone back to some of these early debate. Are tenophores the sister group to all other animals, or are sponges the sister group to all other animals? And we've done that in different ways. And again, every year, I just pick two examples here. There may be a new paper come out, tenophore relationships and their placement as a sister group to all other animals, the same week in another major journal, Improved modeling of compositional heterogeneity supports sponges, a sister group to all other animals, right? Every year we have a series of papers back and forth and now we improve these, now we do the analysis this way, we got that. Well, we did the same thing you said we should do, we added more taxa, now we got the other result. And this is ongoing. And our, you know, ourselves have been doing a lot of those studies, but we try to do that by, by doing very complex analysis we will really curate every step of the phylogenetic uh, definition of our data matrix to have matrices that can really take into account a lot of these biases, right? Like compositional heterogeneity biases. They say, if you have compositional heterogeneity, you get tenophores at the base. If you remove compositional heterogeneity, you get sponges at the base. And, and like these, there are many other biases that people have suggested that will give you one result or the other. So our analysis have tried to start with very, very thorough assignment of orthology, selection of genes that, that pass compositional heterogeneity, you know, a bunch of analysis that we're trying to improve that. And I'm, it's getting late, so I'm gonna go a bit quickly. But basically when we do a lot of these things that tell, telling us we should do, and we have a very large matrix. We always contribute new animals to the analysis. We keep getting tenophores at the base of the animals, right? So no matter what we do with this large analysis, adding more taxa, doing very thorough analysis, we continue getting tenophores at the base. So basically we're still in that, you know, resolve skeleton more or less. But a lot of the analysis that we've used, they had more tenophores, more sponges, more bilaterians, more nidarians, and a single placozoan, right? So basically, one of the things that we've seen in some analysis, actually, that's the only animal at the base that wasn't really well resolved. And um, maybe having better sampling and more genomes of placozoans will resolve the root, you know, the position of this root, because it's the only animal that could shorten this branch between sponges, tenophores, and the rest of the animals. So the problem here was that there was only one genome of placozoan, because there was only one species of placozoan described when we started this work. There are now four, actually. But even though there was a single species described, there have been decade, well, decade at least, that we know that placozoans, placozoans, by the way, is a phylum that has been known since the 1800s. It's a marine animal, but was known from Austria, right? I am sure you all know your geography of Europe very well. Austria is in the middle of Europe. There's no ocean in Austria. So how is a phylum, a marine phylum described from Austria? Because it was found in an aquarium and they didn't know where that animal came from. And they kept it in aquariums for all these years. And then people started sampling 
the oceans targeting placozoans. And you see all these points that you find here? These are basically places in the world where placozoans occur. And when people do phylogenetic analysis of those lineages of placozoans, there's a lot of diversity. These clades are major groups of placozoans that we don't know how they look like. We have their sequences. So these phylum of marine animals only known from Austria, it actually lives all over the temperate and tropical seas in the world. So we decided, why don't we sample some of those placozoans at the genomic level to see if we can break that branch separating sponges and tinophores from the rest of the animal. And this is what we did very briefly. Um, my grad student, uh, Chris Laumer, uh, with some colleagues like Vicky Pierce and, and other people, we got the genome of trichoplax adherens and we did a few other genomes of placozoans from these other lineages that were known. And we sampled now for the first time more than one genome for placozoans to see if we could break these short branches. And <clears throat> a long story short, it actually, it's, they're actually not placed at the base of the animals. They are sister group to Nidarians. And, and that was a, not what we were expecting because, you know, instead of breaking this branch that we were expecting, they actually went a little bit higher up. Still, I think that they taught us something about the early phylogeny of animals. And this is a, a summary of these major lineages. We took all the genes from that analysis and divided into two groups. Groups that are the failed compositional heterogeneity tests, which they say that were very important for um, resolving the phylogeny of animals. And the other more or less half set of genes that pass this compositional heterogeneity test. And unlike all the people who have been telling us you should use the genes that pass the compositional heterogeneity, we found that the ones that fail the compositional heterogeneity are the ones that place sponges as sister group to all the animals. And the other half of genes that pass compositional heterogeneity place tenophores at the base of the animals. That's when we analyze data as amino acids. But if we reduce those amino acids to these Dayhoff groups of amino acids just by their properties, we actually get sponges at the base with both types of analysis. Uh, but we get always placozoans as sister group to Nidaria. So if you were to ask me before the analysis, what type of analysis you want to do, I'd say amino acid level for all the genes that pass compositional heterogeneity, we give us this hypothesis, but we still wanted to understand why are we getting different results? If you reduce the amino acid universe, you get sponges at the base. If you take the genes that fail compositional heterogeneity, you get sponges at the base. If you get what we recommend for phylogenetic analysis, we get this result. Which one is correct? I don't know. Because I don't know if these assumptions are what we should be doing for phylogenetic analysis. But at least now we understand the difference between when we get sponges or tenophores at the base. We also have been looking at many other things in the evolution of these animals. Um, people are looking now at chromosome level of organization. This is this year for the first time we have a chromosome level uh, tenophore genome. And we can see that you can count these squares are basically the number of chromosomes. This is a graph of contiguity of this uh, genome. Each one of those squares are contiguous genes, meaning they're in the same chromosome. And when people have started looking at the architecture of the uh, genomes of all these groups, sponges and tenophores, they find that actually sponges have more similar chromosomal arrangements to other metazoans than again, tenophores do. We still don't know, you know, I'm not gonna claim that, but I just wanna have put some caution there, right? Because the claim before was, well, molecular data says here, but morphology clearly says the other thing, right? And I just want you to be more critical. So. I think that phylogenetic thinking of going from simpler to complex is something that doesn't withhold phylogenetic scrutiny. And placozoans are an example of them, right? Yes, sponges are simpler. That's why they should go lower in the tree. But what about placozoans? They're much higher up and they're very simple. And I mentioned some other examples earlier. Coanocyte like cells exist not only in sponges, they exist in many other metazoans. 
So it cannot be the only character to play sponges at the base, right? Is a type of cell that exists in many animal phyla. And the more we study them at the ultrastructural level, the more animal phyla we're going to discover that they also have these types of cells. The central nervous system of tenophores is architecturally very different from those of other animals. So we have to wait. Is the presence of a nervous system one character, or is the very different architecture of these nervous systems enough to say that maybe there's been two origins of the nervous system in animals? Sponges and placozoans lack central nervous system, but they do have neurotransmitters. Not only they have neurotransmitters, there's now experimental work that show that releasing those neurotransmitters triggers coordinated behavior of cells in those animals, right? So there's no cells specialized in coordinating that behavior, but the neurotransmitters make that cells beat at the unison, for example, when those neurotransmitters are released. So there is some level of coordination, coordination that it's due to some of these neurotransmitters. And the last point I want to make is that this debate on sponges or tenophores has been Unpleasant at points, I have to say, you know, and every, well, but, but what do you believe? It's not about what I believe, it's what, how we interpret the data. And there's been quite aggressive. There's been really nasty papers back and forth on that debate. So, but if we forget about the little nastiness among scientists, it's not that we're killing each other, but what this has really resulted is that people have been doing a lot of anatomical and genomic and behavioral work on two animal phyla that are really important and they were neglected for a long time. So I think that the nicest thing of this debate is that we really learn much more about these animals than ever before. So I'm proud that, you know, we kind of trigger that debate. Maybe it's not yet resolved. Um, you know, I, I could live with either one of those, but I want to, you know, remove these all arguments of simplicity and homology of the quantocytes, because I don't think those are enough to, to do that. So with that, I, I will end. Thank you very much for your attention. Obviously, thank you to my lab for all the work. A lot of this work is being done by past lab members. That's why I'm not showing a current a picture of my current lab. They all work on other aspects. This is something that I have been working for a long time, but now we're, we haven't been doing much work on that very recently. But anyway. I want to acknowledge everyone who's worked in these projects through the years to, to reach these conclusions. Um, yeah. You're good now. <laughs>